it's all for you Yeah, yo There whenever it matters and even more when you feel like it doesn't Protect you so you never feel like you wasn't Know I'm right alongside you, here by that I'm behind you But always got you, end the discussion, nothing means more First one to offer his shoulders for what you preach for Thought I saw the eyes of the world until I seen yours And know that I ain't see a better view yet I'm with whatever, so don't ever you fret Know that you covered, not a hurdle or a heartbreak To change what a part take Cause none of them won't ever get comfortable in your walkway My job is to aware you, fully loaded to prepare you for all of the above that I'm never letting get near you but still in all give you every advantage I found couldn't find a better fit for them along with my crown and since the baton was passed I've been down cause feeling's not an option and dad is not a noun not at all Hey, happy Friday, Saturday morning on a 7 a.m. Friday. My name is Ishmael from Dad Is Not A Noun. I hope everyone's doing well. I have an extraordinary guest with me today. He's a legend, just an awesome, extraordinary man. He is the He was the first black football player for Liverpool FC. He's been fighting against racism all his life, and I'm truly honored to have him on. Howie Gell, how you doing, sir? Thank you for coming on, sir. Thank you for having me on. You're welcome. So how are you doing today? How's, how's, how's your afternoon going so far? Yeah, well, as you say, the, the sun's shining bright here in, in Liverpool. Um, we're getting ready for what's hopefully going to be a, a, a nice weekend to, to break up a lot of the, the monotony that's going on right now. So um, we're just taking these days to come. So again, as I say, the sun's shining, so that's a start. I hear you, sir. And number one, thank you for this book. This is like my favorite book. And uh, you see, thank you for, I got to show the people, for the autograph. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I kind of showed off. Oh, I showed okay. that off to my friends. I'm like, guess who um, autographed this book? Yeah, yeah. Yep, I'm with them. Um, but let's get into it. Um, one of my favorite quotes that you have in the book was by Nelson Mandela, where it says, for to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in the way that respects and the freedom of others. Why was that so that quote so important in that in the book that you wrote? Or well, first of all, Nelson Mandela was a was an icon for black people around the world with the struggle um, that he had to endure in um, a, a very racist regime in South Africa. And um, he's, a, he's a, a man, again, who I have a lot of respect for um, what he had to endure and, and suffer, being, being locked up for fighting for his rights um, for such a long time. And to come out and be the, the president of South Africa and, and to act with, with, with so much dignity after what the colonialist powers had done to him. So it, 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 it made a big impact, um, and he did on, on many black activists growing up, um, especially here in Liverpool. So, um, as I say, he's, he's, he's a legendary figure. Because, um, he actually he lived the struggle, went through the struggle, he endured the struggle. And came out to do the end. So he's a he's a he's a he's a an icon for all of us around the world. And I think that's the point because I, I I compare that quote to Paul Robeson because if I remember back in June twelfth of nineteen fifty six, he was in a hearing called the Un American, where one of the representatives I think his name is Hyde from Pennsylvania asked him like what do you like why are you fighting you know you. You're like this recognized man for your voice. You went to prestige college and everything like that. And he said, basically, I'm not free until my people's free. And I think yeah. what's the beautiful thing about you and this book is that you carry that legacy that, you know, we stand on the shoulder of, 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 of our ancestors and we have to pay it forward. And I think that's one of the most important things about this book is that you do that in this book, but you... And you also do that basically in your everyday life. Yeah, it is how it's it's how I live, and I think again, as I say, that we're, we're put on this this earth for, for purpose. 
Um, I think for those again, as I say, we've got to protect the future of the the next generation. And I think over the last 20 to 30 years, I don't think as black people that we've actually done that. I think we've been trying to consign ourselves um, in, a, in, a, in a way where it's, we're, we're burdens to the white culture. We're always trying to please the white culture. We're always trying to fit in with the white culture. We're always trying to be the white culture instead of focusing on ourselves and our own and our, on our own history. Um, uh, as I say, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a scholar on it, but I do know that um, everybody on this planet originated out of Africa. Everybody, and again, as the the, the migration led itself into Europe, um, they moved further away from the sun. And again, the the, the, the white people again they didn't they, they lost the menel. They say we have a, a gene in our body with melanin, which protects us from the sun. The white people have lost that. And um, as I say, they've, they've geared themselves up and gone back to Africa and, and done all sorts of bad things there in, in, in enslaving us, murdering us, raping us, our women, as say, our children. And they've carried that on all over the world, you know what I mean? Wherever, wherever they've, they've now taken us or wherever we've got, we've always been at the, um, the bottom end of, of, of the barrel. And we've been trying to climb out of it for, for 450 years and we've not been allowed to so we're, we're still in the same position talking about the same things arguing about the same things and and trying to in a certain way trying to plead for some sort of justice or some some sort of change or resignation of how we can interact with in the future and then you talk about how we felt this generation talk about your feelings of the the racism that this generation black athletes uh are dealing with um especially what happened um uh, what's or happening or what happened uh a week ago at uh euro 2021 yeah well again as you say above I, I have kind of like a different view on this um i think again what happened in euro 21 was something that was always going to happen. It was waiting to happen. It's always around the corner. The issue around race or the problems around race is always around the corner. It's always the next conversation. And um, it was just a, a case of where is the, the, the racist and the open-mindedness is that they showed their ugly face. And they, they were waiting for that moment to do it. Oh, everybody's always looking for somebody to blame. And <laughs> we always get the blame for it. And um, on, on the other side of it, there's a, 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 a lot of modern sports personalities, again, who live on social media. And if you don't want to be getting talked about and, and slaughtered on social media, don't go on it. Because they play on it every day and every, there's a say, and every week. And it's, it's that that's turned on them. It's um, racism in, in the UK, as I say, it's 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 been it's been underground and it's now starting to again to to raise its ugly head again and it's 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 coming in on the back of what's going on around the world today with this coronavirus and it's um it's just another conversation it's a conversation that we see out on a on a monthly yearly basis and things just haven't changed it's all it is. It's just another conversation. It's take the knee, Black Lives Matter, do this, do this, do that. Nothing's changed. And all it is is a conversation with the media, where the media play around with it and then go on to another subject and then bring it out again. So if you, people ask me again throughout my life, again, have things changed and have they got better? And they haven't. They haven't for us. We're still in the same place. We're still getting called the same names. We're still getting blamed for the same uh, But at the end of the day, again, as I say, all the, 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 the wealth that the white people have, they've taken from us. They've taken it from Africa. And if you go down to the Tower of London in, in, in London and you look at all the jewels and the, the, um, the artifacts and the art, again, as I say, it all comes out of Africa. So the, the wealth that 
and the security that the culture has is being based on the back of us. And it's like, again, as I say, that they, they don't want to give us that recognition for the fact of what they've done. They don't want an apology again for, for what they've done. And when I'm talking about there, I'm talking about the, the, the white culture in, in general. There are obviously, again, as I say, um, mixed race families um, all over the world. And again, as I say, we're, 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 not, we're not actually talking about them. We're talking about the, the, the ones who want to jump on social media. We're talking about the ones who want to batter um, anybody who's not white out in, inside a football stadium after the game. So these are the, the, the complex issues of, of the things that we have to deal with on a daily basis as being black people. We're conscious of this, of, of, of when we go out of our house every day, what, what, what are you going to face today? What's the, what are the challenges? Are you going to have to deal with, with issues around race? Chances are, at some stage throughout the day, you are. So it's, um, it's the, 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 the complex issues with a, a subject that I think again is 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 it it for it to for it to be eradicated. There's two things that happen: is that white people have to accept, uh, or the white there's a white culture that has to accept again what's gone on in the past, and make some sort of complacent to to change for the future for our children. Um, they have to write it into history, because again there are, there are a lot of things that are missed of history. Um, on purpose and um, <clears throat> it's neither that or there's going to be anarchy between the two cultures where you get black dissidents against against the white racist and everybody else gets caught up in that so it's um, it, 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 it has to be a global a global um, issue a global um, a direction if, if, we, if, if it if it was to be changed, everybody's got to be involved in it. But again, as I said, you, you ask one question and the answer is very really relevant and you say to yourself, is that going to happen? And the chances are is that it's not because it suits a certain group of certain people to, for it to stay like that and for it to be like that. So how do you combat, you know, I know you've been blackballed for being an activist. Um, from like the group of people that said, just shut up and play your sport. Like here in America, they tell athletes just shut up and, and play basketball. You don't know, know it. don't touch that subject. You don't know what you're talking about. So over abroad, I know you get that. So how do you combat that? Um, I do it in, in, in different ways. Again, as I say, as I, as you was in my book again, I, I was brought up in a, in a in a white neighborhood, so I could understand the mentality of of of, of white people. Because again, as I said, put in my book, I was fighting them every day, and I, I was fortunate that I had two older brothers who who gave me all the support um, that I, that I needed, and I'm kind of like again protected me from a, from a distance kind of like way, but. Um, in, in in general, and as I say, it was neither having to, to to fight your way out of situations um, in the in in, in my, uh, my younger days, and as I got older again, uh, what experienced I found ways of how I could deal with it and how I could challenge it. Um, but I think what it is is important is that we that we that we we pass this on to our children. Again, our children are being diluted now. Um, they're being subsumed to, to, to social media and, and tech and walking around like that. It's time to case our children um, on the past and make them aware again as of the future. Because I think a lot of those, um, a lot of modern day footballers now, again, they don't know about their own culture and their own upbringing. And they know more about the white culture than their own. So the the subservient to it, and they bend to it, and they like it, and they want to rub up against it. But when you again, as to say, you're talking about your your own history and the things that people like you have been through over the years, and the sacrifices that people have had to make, the the the, the young men and women who've been made it, the mean Stephen Lawrence, Anthony Walker, things, you know I mean things like this. And again, when you agree 
back and you think to yourself, well, you know, you'd ask that question, has anything changed? Has it got better? And the answer is unequivocally no. And I think going to the book, which um, kind of I want to kind of uh, dig into because I think it's important from what we're conversation. Because what I love about your book is that you get a deep dive into the history of Liverpool before you tell your story. Yeah, and you kind of you 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 connect the dots because often when people tell their yeah. story, they don't connect the dot. They just tell a story. But what you do is you tell from the beginning. You know, especially from your father, grandfather. So talk about that significance of telling that history before you actually tell, because that's a part of your story. So talk about that significance of telling that that history. I think if in, in, in the first instance is that I'm a, a, a very proud African. I say me, me, me heritage uh, is, is African. Um, I know me heritage uh, from the African side, and um, I'm, as I say, I'm ever so proud of it. And I think again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's another situation again where I, I looked at the game, the nights, and everything around around with this three lines and the England badge, and again, people wanting to please again. That this, it's kind of like that old master type of like, you know, people know master, master. Can I, can I play? Can I play? Um, the the, uh, the uh, sorry, another argument that I was put that put up is that these these players who've been abused, you never hear them coming out and talking about the the the, the abuse when it's not them. If if black footballers came out as a, co a collective and um, shut down, stopped social media, then you're making a statement, but you can't complain about a, a media portal that you've been using for yourself and your own promotion and. Da, 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 and now you want to complain about it because somebody's misusing it. So the um, the the point that I'm trying to make is is that we have to change the way we the, the way we think about ourselves, not about white people, about our own culture. We need to learn more about our own culture, about what's gone on in the past. The, the, um, the wealth and the riches that Africa beholds about changing the economic status because that's our biggest problem is economics. We don't own no corporations and big business or media portals or television networks or anything like that. Again, we can't have them. They won't let us have them because I think that they think that that's a voice for us, a loud voice. So these are the things that, that have to change in culturally and i think again one of the biggest things that has to change in the future is that we have to start working more together with each other instead of fighting and killing each other and looking at us uh, at our brothers and sisters as the end they're not but we've been told that they are and we're sort of like again pushed or led to think that they are so it's 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 it's, it's if, if there's to be a change in the future it 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 has to be directed by us. Um, we don't really need the white culture to say we can go anywhere in the world and pick up anything from Africa and come and sell it in Europe ourselves. We can take things from Europe and take them into Africa and sell them to the African ourselves to keep that economic wealth and that economic growth within, within our own hands. And I think that's important too, because again, it goes back to the history. Like it's been done. You know, we we have histor historical of great African kingdoms that thrived and things like that, which this generation doesn't know. And that's why they need to know, you know. And that's why I think it's important that people read this book because you kind of get <laughs> like an insight of why, you know, the what, why when it comes to slavery, you know. Um, we, we've been we've been educated in white schools and we've been given the white education and white education tells you that Africa is a poor country where people are walking around with nothing on their feet and they live in mud huts and when you hear the truth about Africa that the fair cities on the planet were there had irrigation and we had streetlights, and we had things like this, you know what I mean? But this is part of the history 
that they don't tell in the schools. And we need to tell it ourselves to our children. As parents, again, it should be something, again, that the, a little bit of information about, again, about our, our history, that should come from your parents. But because the parents don't know it, they've been, again, submitted against you. What, what the white people have told us in the schools, and we've believed it. And that's where the confusing part started again when you're doing this school and you start learning about history and the places again where we can go for our own history as 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 uh, as black people and the understanding of it and and more or less, I think the the acceptance of it because I think that the the the, the are black people again who have that coon mentality that they don't want to believe again what the truth is they want to follow what they've been told. And and it's, and it's a sad thing to to that you know just to make it you know it's like a crap in the barrel mentality you know you take one down so you can reach to the top but at the end of the day you're not reaching to the top because you're you're still in that that barrel regardless of the fact and I yeah, think well, that's we, a we have a we have a, we have, a, <clears throat> we have a, uh, what's this thing? Um, we have a ladder approach as opposed to our lives and our um, progression. And as we go up the ladder, we pull it up behind us to make sure yeah. that the people behind us again don't follow in suit or be the same level as. Yeah. And that's what we do again, as I say, as a culture, because we're, we're subservient to the white culture. We're trying to please them and we're trying to make sure again that we stay in that position instead of bringing everybody together so that when we get in that room, there's more people that look like you rather than you being the only one in there who made it. And, and then, um, you know, one thing I loved about the book, when you, you kind of talk about your, your your father growing up a little bit and him coming, you know, his story a little bit, like, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, me, me dad came here because um, he, he was uh, he was working on, on the ships during the war, so he delivering supplies. Um, uh a few of my uncle, in fact, one of my uncles was um, was on a, a merchant ship, which was coming into, I think it was coming in, no, it was leaving Liverpool. Um, it had just uh, dropped off, and it was torpedoed, and my uncle was killed. It was my brother's, my mother's brother. So again, for the for the war effort, again, as I say, we, we, we had losses um, as well. But my dad came here after the war, and um, and again, as I say, the, there, was a, there was a population shortage here in Europe. So they started bringing in labour again from more well, our labour that's coming from Africa and, and the colonies and um, to work in it to, to rebuild Britain. Um, uh, my dad was uh, originally from Sierra Leone in West Africa, and as I say, the significance of, of, of Sierra Leone to the the slave trade and the slave movement, and Sierra Leone was, was the the place which which again the capital is called Freetown. Years ago, again, during the slave, the slave trade, again, if you were able to escape your slaver and you got to Sierra Leone, you became a free man. That's why it was called Freetown. So it um, it played a significant role in in the history of um, of Africa. And um, that settled in, in here in Liverpool. I married me, me mum. Uh, my mum's family were from Ghana, um, West Africa. So it. Um, the struggles that we that we that we that we had to endure, and there was a there was a, there was a lot of stuff growing up that I didn't understand. Like me 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 dad had to me dad used to drive buses here, and he was he was driving a bus and my mum was on the bus, and some guy decided to racially abuse my mum, and be asking my mum to to get off the seat and stuff like that. My dad stopped the bus, but the boy battered him. And that was sort of like the first, my first introduction to, to what had been going on. I'd been getting it and feeling it myself, but I didn't, again, I couldn't understand that my parents would be subjected to it as well. But we all were, again, to me, 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 me mum, my dad and my, and my sister, my two brothers, they moved back down to the, the south, they back down to the black community straight away. They didn't like it. But I was only young again. I had to go to school there and that's it. Had to endure the the, the presence of um, being brought up in a in a white community. 
And then um, talk about, because um, I know in, in the book, you had a photo of your father. He was the first Black, the only Black to work for Ford. Talk about the significance of that photo. Yeah, the game is same with me. Our fathers, when they came here, they wanted to, uh, they, 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 they weren't militant. They weren't, again, as I say, they learned to protect themselves and fight against, again, the racism that was here in the city. And Liverpool was, again, one of the most racist cities in the UK, in Europe. Um, again, Liverpool, again, itself, it built its wealth on the back of the slave trade. Before slave trade, again, say Liverpool was just called the poop. Because again, the after slave trade, they had the deliver, and it became one of the major players economically across Europe. All the slave, all the slave ships were registered here in Liverpool. All the slave triangles came through Liverpool, so all of the the, uh, the cotton and the what's name were, were that were going to the mills. It all came into into to Liverpool. So Liverpool has played a, a significant role. All the banks were here in Liverpool. Um, the amnesty to the, the slave trade in America started here. Um, was it the 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 little competitors? There's here the movement started here. They started the planning here and shipped their ideas again across the the Atlantic to into into the states. So Liverpool in itself has played uh, a very significant role again, as I say. And when you see the the um, the wealth here. In in the um, the 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 housing, again they were the the they built um, beautiful Tudor houses all over all over our, our area where where we live, and um, these this is where all the rich lived, all the ones who were benefiting off the off the slave trade, and it was just a uh, well what's that say a job, but it was just a, a turnaround that in the nineteenth and twentieth century. This is where black people settled when they came into the city. But the areas have always been run down. But now again, it's changing. What they've done is to say after the 1981 riots here, they've started to place us and move us out all over the city so that we don't have a hub no more. Again, this is the agenda that they do. That they, 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 they're very, very clever. They've said to themselves, well, we're going to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And they threw some crumbs on the floor. Few people are there who force in the right start a fire room instead of the overall goal of, of sticking together. And there's a plan for this. This is what we want. This is what we want you to do. But because again, as I say, some of us adopted that coup mentality of the crumbs on the floor, fight over the crumbs instead of saying you can have them because we want them. we've been we've been fighting here now for the cake. For jobs, for respect, for, for for dignity, and we've never ever been uh, afforded that here. And um, the fact that I was became the, the first black player to, to play for Liverpool, and I think it's significant because Liverpool is an iconic club. The city right. is an iconic city, and it's 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 known all around the world. And in football, again, to break into um, uh, a team. Uh, of that significance because it, it, it was a, a top team. It was, a, it was just to embark on a on a roller coaster of a ride that took them to dominate in uh, world football. So the significance of me being the first black player to go in there again is is, is a is a proud moment because again I grew up being a Liverpool fan. I dread being being a player for them, and those those. Those those dreams again when you when you have those dreams and you get the chance to live them, and then when you get the chance to live them, you see that the dream is not the one that you had the, 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 when all those nights ago. Again, as I say, that there are now those those issues that you've always feared of race, of of of, um, of indignity, of trying to to fight your corner. Of trying to be able to to fight your corner, without being um, seen to be over aggressive. But I told them in there again, as I say, when I went in there, they quickly learned that if you call me or you fight me, I'm gonna fight you. 
that's the way I've been brought up. And if you have to take a harden, you take a harden. Again, I take a hard, that's what hardens for me colour. But from a, from a, a today in Lynn in Liverpool is that it's it's a it's a it's full of great people, like minded people and the militants here. There was a scout here and the militants. In fact, they have a saying here now saying that we're not English, we're scouts. And England is always, or the, the country, the government, the, uh, the monarchy has always forsaken Liverpool. They've always poured scorn on Liverpool. They've always put Liverpool down. And we've always been at loggerheads with them. We've always been fighting them. We've always been challenging them. So we're at a, we're at, we're at a point now in, in, in time where there's, I think, again, as I say, the ruling powers have been very, very clever and astute in, in what they did after 1900. They've kind of like diluted the city of white people as well. And we have a new population coming in now from um, from, uh, from, a, from Europe, with the Eastern Europeans, the Arabs, um, white families again. So they've kind of like displaced our community and mm-hmm. diluted it. Where there's only a few people here now who were who were militant. The older ones, the likes of ourselves, again, to say we can't go out on the streets and be fighting anymore. We can wise up our young people. We can educate our young people. But again, it's a you ask the question now of whether our young people are are wanting to be educated, or whether they the, again the are too busy trying to fit into the 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 um, the, the the white cultural world. Instead of focusing on, on on our own culture and our own colour, and we've got a great a great culture, we've got a great history, we've got great places again where we can we can go as black people in go to Africa, we can go to uh, South America. I mean, we've got these 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 things and these connections again that we don't make ourselves through business to come here. so just through leisure we don't make these connections we'll go and spend our money on holiday in dubai we'll go there we'll go europe we'll go spain we'll go greece portugal but we don't go to africa well i do but as a as a as a as a, as a culture why not go somewhere again where the money that you're going to spend is going to enhance that culture but again the picture that the white culture paints of Africa is one of Africa is poor. The, you see a young child running across a village with a dot on his feet and a fly landing on the nose. And people, ooh, Daisy, that's Daisy. Uh, but when you go to Africa, you step off that plane. Africa is beautiful. I mean, beautiful. It's, it's, it's idyllic. But they don't show you that side of it. So you did on the nature program and you see that the cheetah chasing the bison across the across the plane, <laughs> but they don't show you again uh, as, 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 as a people of, of our lives. We don't show it. We can't show it because we don't have no media. So it's kind of like a it's kind of like a broken biscuit broken biscuit approach of how we 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 get this message out to our to our young people. We need to educate our young people. Our, edu- our, our young people are going in the wrong direction. They're sleepwalking themselves into a nightmare. And unless we educate them on, on what the future can, will be, then we have to say, sit down and, 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 and question ourselves then as adults of what legacy have we passed on? Yeah, that's I, I, yeah I, I totally agree because it's about supporting um people that are creating, like, I'm a big fan of Bino and Fino, you know, mm. um, the Nigerian, uh, cartoon show, um, made in Nigeria by Nigeria. And you get the true perspective of a Nigerian family. And so anytime they have something on, I'm always telling people, you need to watch Bino and Fino, watch Bino and Fino, watch it. Cause they give you a, a great history list lesson on the history of Africa and so yeah, it's a it's up to us to um, tell people about what's going on, 
and just share what people are creating all over Africa because that's important. That's that's our duty, you know. Again, we're on the shoulder of ancestors, and our, and our, and our, our goal and what we need to do is pass it forward. And I think that's important. But also talk about your mom. Your mom played a critical role in your life before she passed away. Um, just talk about your mom a little bit. Well, my mum was again the same. She was my protector. Um, with my dad being out to uh, 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 work a lot, but, but we, my dad was a disciplinarian. Again, coming from from Af as Africans, where it was the same. It wasn't just significant to, to me or our family. Again, all my my friends again who the, the the fathers came from Africa or the West Indies. Again, we were disciplined growing up. I mean, there was a a, a, a packing order, but there was a thing again that you. You had to realise there were things you could do, there were things you could do, and there was no question about it. And my dad was that type of person, and my my dad was a disciplinarian. So he did wrong, he was getting the belt or getting a, a slap. I'm brought up like that again. My mother was the other side. Of it. My mother was the one who had to pick up the the broken bits of of me getting a, a good hard enough. My dad. Um, it was the comfort and the love and um, it was something again as I say that you, you don't really realise when you're young but when you, you you get old and you become a parent yourself and you're in that same position again as I say I changed again I didn't hit my kids right. um, I, I made a conscious thing that I, that I was uh, in fact yeah I'd, 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 I'd maybe give them a, a smack or a slap but it wasn't a policy where there's every time the kids did wrong that I was slapping them or I was beating them. I'd talk to them or I'd punish them in a different way. And um, again, that was my generation or our generation, which was was the change. We 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 said to ourselves that we're not going to bring our kids up like that. Oh, that's the the discipline. But we didn't realise again how valuable that discipline was to us until we got older. The, 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 sorry, the discipline from our fathers, the smacks in that. Because again, they were, they were trying to um, reassure, or they knew about what lied ahead of us as young black males growing up in a white culture. And they knew again, as I say, that the, there was going to be um, times again where we were going to be arrested for something that we didn't do. Right. Being in the wrong place because that was something that we that we that we were there. So our fathers were trying to sort of like wise us up and protect us from that, and right. they they were trying to do it from an African point of view because they hadn't been brought up here with the white culture. So again, you had a you had two two different situations. You had one at home, and you had a different one when you went out on the streets. Because again, you had to, um, again, where I was brought up again, I had to be on my guard 24 hours a day because I was a target, because I was different. I was a target. And people would be walking up to me and saying, do you want to fight? Just as simple as that on the street. Yeah. And again, I've been brought up in the place. Somebody said that to me, do you want to fight? The answer was, I had my foot would be in their face or my head. <laughs> but they've asked me that question. I did, I did, I did answer, that's how I answered it. Um, again, as I say, I, I kind of like grew my reputation now that I could fight. And those kids again who thought that it was easy for them to build their reputation for themselves by fighting me didn't fight me no more. So the, that 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 way of thinking from from our from our parents again, as I say, it was kind of like hit and miss because. Our parents had never been in this situation before where they were having to, to, to bring up their children and their siblings in a racist regime. And how do you protect yourselves and how do you protect your children? And it, it was an um, ambiguous uh, task for, for both me and my dad and trying to, to, to survive in it. In a in a in an environment that changed every day, it was never the, again the same. It could be somebody knocking on your door and bringing in a, a pie and saying, um, 
the you know there's there's a pie or whatever for your family. There's somebody throwing bricks at the door and running away, and you've neither again if you get your eyes on them now, you've neither got to go out the house and go look for them, or you've got to wait for that time when the the time arises where. Is you see this face up there across the road who's been thrown except your windows and stuff like that. So you've got to go across the road now and deal with it. You know I mean? And make sure that that boy or girl didn't throw the stones at your door no more because they'd have to know the consequences. There had to be a consequence. I had to invent or put a consequence to them. If Richard might uh, say at our door, this is what I'm going to do to you. And it was... Um, it, it, be, it became really significant because it's like I started getting a name of being a hard knock and I didn't want to be a hard knock. I just wanted to be me. I might be football. I played football 24 hours a day if I could. But I had to deal with all the other issues again as soon as I walked up. And here again, even on the football pitch, you get with the kids again, you go past them all because you, then they call, oh, do you want to stop? again calling names and then the football game now turns into a fight and I don't forget I have friends up there again who fight with me and our friends again who say you didn't who, who wouldn't who started wanted to stay on the side well again that was kind of like a way of how I sort out my friends because those ones who didn't stand with me they weren't my friends no more and then um talk about how it um how, like after your mom passed, because your mom passed when you were 15, right? Or was it 15 or 16 when she passed away? Yeah, 15. Um, yeah, how did, it's just, they, it broke how did that How did that affect it you and then alter the relationship with your father? Yeah, well, it, it, well, it, it broke me. As I say, that was that was me, me mom, me love, me soulmate, me, me, me best friend, me comfort. And now, again... I'm left here with my dad. My sister had got off and gone to London. There's only me and my dad living in that house now. And um, it, it, it was a serious blow because I went off the rails again. And say I, I couldn't fun, I couldn't work it out. I couldn't work it out. I wasn't prepared for my mum leaving the, the planet at the age of 60 and me only being 14, 15. I wasn't prepared for that. And as I say, it, 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 I nearly went under some of the things that I started doing as a result of um, my mum's death were, again, you would say, bang out of order for how I was dealing with people. But it was just a, a function that I couldn't understand. My dad didn't explain it to me. My dad couldn't explain it to me. Um, he did have compassion. Um, my brothers again tried to and helped me. Uh, my sister was away in, in London. She left Liverpool um, because of my dad. So, let's say it was it was. It's the single most feeling, the the worst feeling that you can have. In in in, the the, the only comparison I think again you could put with it is if you lost one of your own children. That's the only comparison that I could put to it is losing your mother. It's uh, devastating for me. I took that devastation out onto the streets. And, and that devasta and devastation... To, to, to exact me up. Yeah. That devastation kind of led you to, you know, you had your one foot into, you know... The, the streets a little bit, but also, you know, you, you know, you were practicing. No, I had, I had, I had, I had both feet. Oh. On yeah, both feet? Okay, explain. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, well, uh, again, Liverpool, or well, the streets of Liverpool is a, is a, is a survival exercise. And that's, again, what you have each day. My survival became more apparent because I was having to survive with the people who'd enslaved us. I mean, they, they were the majority where I lived. I didn't live with it in the black community. So that survival method was imprinted on my every morning when I got up out of bed, is that I, uh, 
I was always wary again about when I, what would what was going to happen when I went out the front door of um, who's going to confront me. Could it be a challenge? Is it somebody again who wants to be my friend? All sorts of different emotions. But we have to think about this. Even today, we have to, again, sitting here, I've got to think about what the consciousness outside my front door, what am I going to meet? Am I going to meet somebody again who's going to look at me as if I'm scum? Is he going to look at me because I'm black? Is he going to cross the road and walk around because I'm black? And that in itself is a... Is a is a is a is a consciousness when you watch somebody do that white walk across the road walk past you and come back on the other side of the road and you're thinking why have they just done that Is that bad or is it, again is it, can they not walk past me neither so it's a it's 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 kind of like a, a, a process that we all have to deal with and some of us are more acceptant to the outcomes and the results. And instead of challenging them and fighting them and standing up for yourself or our culture, again, when you stand up for yourself and our culture, again, maybe your children or somebody else's kids will benefit from it. Maybe they see it and find courage and dignity. So that's what I want to do. That's how I want to be. That's what I want to say. And just having that, that, that change of... Um, motive education and, and being forthright and not being sub subservient to being a coon of being upset and taking the easy option which is selfish rather than take the hard option which is collective of our culture and and, and i think that's like i said that's um, that's important as as is community and culture um, but talk about your your career playing football because again, you know, you lost your mom. You know, you, you're like you're on this rising trajectory into you know football. So like like talk about your mom saying, you know, so like like take me into that world. Yeah, well, as a, as a result of me, mom's dead and death and me going off the rails, I ended up going to prison. Um, I got four months in a, a, a young offenders um, institution for for assault on a police officer. Um, and it was kind of like a, a game for me. Um, the rails that I'd been going off, it wasn't until they had the first night in the police cell of starting a sentence and I'm thinking to myself, do I want to carry on down this road? This is not a nice place. I've never been in this environment before where I'm locked up and I'm not going home. So those those conscious thoughts that you have, you, you try and help yourself feel better about yourself in the situation that you are and start planning for this situation. Because tomorrow morning now, I've got to go out and meet the rest of the inmates. And I know that there's going to be a pen order in there because the prison system is not dissimilar from the street system. So there's going to be a pecking and order in there. The good thing about it was that there were a couple of black kids in there from other parts of um, the country um, who were found solace with and, and again, obviously a friendship and also, again, support. But again, there was a an incident in there again in, in, uh, not long after I'd gone into the the, uh, the prison system where a bully tried to bully me um, and we, 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 we were having a, a football game and he, I've gone past him and he's snapped me, he's gone right round about and I've jumped up and he, he's put his, his face in my face um, again as I say just instinct, I've just butted him and he's knocked out on the floor now. So this sends a message again to the rest of them in the prison. My, my status changed from that day because this boy was a bully. He thought he was king of the thinking in there. Um, I told everybody that it wasn't. And his, obviously his position changed as well as mine did. But what I didn't want to adopt 
the, the culture of I'm the leader, I'm the bully, I'm the king, I'm the this, you want to do that. I wasn't like that. And I didn't want that mindset and I didn't want that mantle. If somebody else wanted to take it up, that was their business. But bullying people had never, never been part of my business. So it, 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 it changed. And it's again, it's, it's amazing again how these, these things change we stand up to the bully. And um, when the bully went down, a lot of the other kids again who've been bullying now, they became my friends because they thought to protect them now against this kid who who'd been bullying. Them. So it's a it's a, it's kind of like again, it's it's a it's it's you you're moving I'm I'm constantly moving from different worlds into different places. When I went into Liverpool Football Club, it was a different world from the one I've been brought up into. When you go to Africa, it's a different world from the one that you live in. When you when I moved back down to the uh, the South End, you know, the, the, where the black community was, it became a different world for me. And I think that's what, what kind of like helped me at Liverpool is that I just, when I came out of prison, I went, moved back down to the South End and started living with people who look like me. I started feeling a lot better about myself. And I think that the game of football again started to improve because I was more happier and more comfortable um, about what I was doing, but more about with the people that I was living with. And I'm a strong believer that uh, representation and affirmation builds our confidence. And, you know, telling that story that you start loving the sport because you start seeing players that look like you. And yeah. then also what that did was it built your confidence when you were on the field. So all that racism yeah. and stuff, by being in prison and um, putting down that bully, you're like, you know what? I can handle this. This this, this racism yeah. thing, this is nothing to me. I can handle it. I can I just punch the bully in the face. And I think that's important. But going back, what were some of the black football players that you looked up to while you were coming up? Well, obviously, Pele and Eusebio, um, and again, growing up in the 60s and 70s, uh, the coverage of football, uh, world coverage of football, only extended to the likes of the World Cup. My first experience of, of Pele was the 1966 World Cup here in England when they kicked him out of the competition. They, they, they just um, hacked him every time again because that was the only way that they could deal with him he was a very very skilled high, highly skilled footballer he was a highly intelligent footballer and the only way that the the, the i think it was the or the uruguayans the argentine south americans they just hacked him and hacked him and um but he became he became an icon for for all football and you save him he was at benfica and played for portugal again another another iconic player um, here in the UK, Clyde Best uh, played for West Ham, uh, and, and then, as I say, the, the later days again, the likes of Laurie Cunningham and Vince Soler, players like that again, as I say, black players. Because again, the first thing that I would do when I went when I, when I was start playing football, if I met, if I met a black player playing for the opposition, I always went and shake his hand, give him a hug. And you know I mean you talk about it again about or you touch or skate round the situation that we were in, two black players playing in a white man's world in a white man in, in in a predominantly white man's game, trying to make our way. Um, we'd have to deal with. Um, it's it's uh, it's well known the game that I played in Germany. Is that there were seventy thousand Germans in there, and they were calling me. I was the only—I think I was the only black person in that stadium, and they were calling me the monkey chance every time I got the ball. I say to me because these things motivated me, because when they were shouting over, they were ooh, 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 I was getting faster and faster and harder and harder and again and again, because I knew that I was representing black people. If I went under, I'm letting black people down. So I, again, I, I, it, it, it kind of like invigorated me. And I think again, what it did, it inspired a lot of black people to see that we can stand up in the, their cauldron and we can take what they want to shout and what they want to say. And it's not going to affect what we've got to do. 
And I and that's and that's an awesome story because it goes back punching the bully right in the face. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's the best way to do it. And I know again is I I know again is the times when I've scored and I come stand in front of them like that. And I'd be looking into their eyes and you can see their <laughs> hatred. I mean they want to come on that pitch, they want to take what they've got in their pockets and come on that pitch and give it to me. Well, Again, they couldn't. I mean, there's, 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 a, there's even a. I always thought to myself, if somebody did cross that barrier, what was he going to do? And I'm going to protect myself. When they come across the barrier, I'm stopping being a footballer. And I've got to be okay. And I've got to be, they come there again, I've got to do what I've got to do to protect myself. I'm not worried about protocol or being a footballer. I'm a human being in a, in a, in a stadium full of, of, of white people and I've got to stand there and watch somebody again beat me no, 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 no as I said, I wasn't brought up that way again, as I say, I've always been brought up to challenge um, adversity and racism and as I say, it's it stood me in good stead and I passed that same mantra on to my children and, and and talk about like some of the violence you had to deal with on the on a soccer field maybe or off the soccer field because of your race because I know there wasn't really any protocol protocol to protect to protect black football players from violence. No, well, yeah, you, you, again, your rights again. There's a, I remember playing a game um, for Sunderland to be played at. Um, I'm, I'm thinking it was it was one of the Bristol clubs, and there's a player on the opposite team, and we've been we've kind of like been having it all the way through the game. He'd been kicking me, and I'd been kind of pacing. So it got to the stage where was, I think we were, we were we were kind of like rolling on the floor, and the referee it it got us both together. So while we're talking to the referee, he called me a nigger. So I've looked at the referee like that and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And I said to the referee, are you going to let him call me that? The referee said, that's your business. Wow. So I just said, okay, well, all right, well, if that's, that's my business, then I'll take matters in, into my own hand. And next thing again, you see is uh, that boy's getting stretched off because I had to do something again to put him in his place but the referee again said he didn't call me a nigger and didn't say nothing about it didn't do nothing about it didn't book it didn't even retribute him again he told me that that was my business so i had wow. to take my business into a place again that i didn't want to do because they're going there to play football not to be fighting not to be hating people so it, that's a, that's a, how, how how bad it got, and how bad, again there was there was a, there was no consequence, and the, the, you could take the stuff from the terraces because you couldn't do nothing about. It. But when it was coming, when it was coming off the pitch, off off for the players, um, somebody called me a nigger, and I'd wait for months that maybe the next game or the next game to get them back. I mean, I remember it. So the, the, and, and again, that's a that, that's a consciousness now that you you've got to go into a football game thinking about uh, I owe you one. Hey, I remember you. Uh, that were players also, and I remember the boy that called me a nigger. I'm gonna do him. And that was the consciousness that I that, that I had, rather than I've got a football game, a cool, important football game. Got to think about me, me diet, me, me rest, me technique, me this whatever. But we've got to add on another issue. And that's how it was. There was wow. no protection. There was no, as I say, there was no consequence for, for the white players. And the consequence we fell on the black players because we retaliate or we do something that we end up getting sent off. My first day, well, when I, when I, one of my first games for, for Liverpool reserves, we played a club, Berry, which is only up the road. It was about, it's about, 60 odd miles away from Liverpool and there was a white kid from Liverpool playing in Betty's team and it was at Anfield. Um, we were we were 2-0 we were up 
I'd score both of the goals. Um, we we had a coming together. Um, as we've jumped up, he, he told me a black C. But before he got the C out of out of his out of his mouth, I did some three or four times. So we both got sent off. Um, again, as I say, this was the first time now that I've had to show them this in the club. You know what I mean? So I'm thinking the club aren't going to be happy about this, me right. getting sent off. And on the Monday morning, I had to go in and see me, me manager, Bob Paisley. Um, he just said to me, it was something which, which stood with me for, for, for the end of the day. He said that people are going to use all sorts of methods to stop you. They can't stop you with the, the, the speed. They haven't got it. They can't stop the, you with the skill. They haven't got it. So they they're going to use other ways and you're going to fall into a trap of being getting sent off and you're not helping your team. So the only value about Sal is the fact that that boy got sent off as well. But he said, but that's not the lesson. He said, you've got to learn the lesson that people are going to use different ways to stop you. And your personality, you know, that protective thing that you have is that it's going to get you into a place where you're going to be spending loads of time suspended. Um, that can't happen at this club. So you've got to start learning the lessons. And, and again, I did. I knew that I couldn't do that again. And I had to find out different ways again of how I could protect myself and how I could get my own back. But um, it was it was, it was was a lesson that, that I had to learn. But again, as I say, the, the lessons are there for us to learn. And if you can learn something positive out of something negative, then that's a good thing. And talk about a lesson learned, too, when you talk about community. Um, let's go back to the riot of 1981. I remember a story you told me of, like, you wanted to be a part of it and help out. But uh, one of the one of the, the, uh, one of, um, the people that you're close to told you, don't do it. Talk about that. Talk about that. Yeah, well, the, again, the, 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 the riot started in, in 1981. Um, we... We just won the European Cup in Paris, and um, me and my friend we 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 booked a holiday to to Portugal, and we took our girlfriends away, and um, just to get a, a couple of weeks away uh, before the the new season came round, and we arrived there on the on on the Saturday night on the on the Saturday afternoon here in Liverpool. There was there was an incident where there's the the police had chased one of the figures from the community, um, tried to arrest him and also and it had gone on. That night I flew to to Portugal, so when we got up Sunday morning, Sammy always had this thing about the, the newspapers. So we went down the shop, bought the newspapers, brought them back up, and said, "Have you seen this?" It was all over with the Portuguese newspapers about what was going on in Liverpool. And I'm thinking, wow, we've just left there yesterday. And it wasn't like that. But it was a big kickoff. Um, it showed a lot of buildings being burnt. Um, showed a lot of police officers again who were, who were injured. So I've gone to the phone now to ring home, to ring me, me, me brother to find out what's happened. Um, again, as I say, he's told me the story. And, Again, as I say, it didn't end that night because the riots were on for about, I think it was about seven eight nights. And we were getting the daily reports of, of again, of what was going on. So the, they were going back home and the riots were still going on. So um, my brothers were were were, um, were leaders in, 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 the, uh, in, in the committees and uh, the... Um, the people who were trying to bring the community together to make sure again that everybody again was safe, people were protected, people were getting snatched by the police. So there, there was a there was a there was a community liaison um, group uh, within our community, and I was at one of the meetings, and I I was I was up for it. I was telling them again what we're going to be doing tonight and what we're going to be doing. Let's go and do this and let's go and do that. Um, they just said nah. nah that if, if you get caught they'll use it against all of us I said you're in a, in a, in a position now where there's again, you, you can entire the future by 
what you do and what you've done. And for they would use that as a negative. If they could get you rioting, and again, as I say, and they jail you for it, because you've 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 been outspoken about all the other the racism in the past, is that they'll jail you for it. And that would just put a, a bad shadow on the the city, the black community of Liverpool, um, and what they were trying to do. So they kind of like again made me see sense. I just wanted to be with them, stand with them, and be um be a part of uh, the struggle. And again, say they offered the a more plausible way of how I could help the struggle by me being an uh, uh, iconic footballer playing for an iconic club. And maybe again, I could and I did. I used my voice from there. And by using your voice, you've been blackballed, let's be honest. <laughs> knowing, you know, knowing yeah. your history and how they try to def deface your humanity uh, just you as a person, you know, for like most of your career. But talk about uh, Munich. Talk about that historical time in history. Take take us back to that day. Yeah, well, the the again, as you say, the the club had, had had a horrific season with injuries, and um, I played in the reserves on the Saturday. I think I scored a hat trick um, when I went on on Monday morning. And before I started to get in, uh, Roy Evans, my gaffers, come to me and said that you need to go home, me and Ian Rush, um, because you're, you're coming away with us to, to Munich. So I thought, oh, but that'll be nice again. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to see the game um, first hand. I, I didn't think that I'd be involved in it. And um, as I say, the story goes out the Bob Paisley and the, the club, they were meticulous. They knew that the Germans would be meticulous. So they knew the Germans weren't going to know about me. And um, clever ploy. Because uh, the one thing that we that we have as black people is one of our attributes is we have pace. We're fast. And there's nothing better than running alongside somebody. And you know that you've got another two gears to go into. And they're flat <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> and they're struggling for oxygen, so it was it was a shrewd move, and uh, uh, it, it, it worked out for for both Liverpool and and, and for me. But um, just before the, the the again when we arrived at the ground, um, the gaffer told me that I'm on the bench I'm one of the five substitutes. So after say, seventeen minutes, uh, I came down again. He's he's been targeted. And he's been injured, and um, Ian Rush is sitting next to me, and they've paid twenty grand, which was a lot of money for a young player for Rushy. So I'm thinking, well, money's going to do more diligence, and they're going to put him off. But they didn't send the shout went along the bench for Howard to get ready, and I was that engrossed in the game that when it comes to me, I've gone to pass the message on, and I was the last one. <laughs> So I've, I've I've jumped up and I was gonna say I've got I've got warmed up and I'm and I'm and I'm I'm thinking they put me on here because I'm looking at Kenny Kenny was struggling he was limping so I'm thinking my God they're gonna put me on they're gonna put me on so they did and uh, as I say the the story is history um I did my job I did what I what I was supposed to do. I did what I was good at, and it worked. It worked for the for the club. I kept their defence occupied, which gave our, our defence a little bit of respite. Um, there were four players in that team again who came out of Liverpool reserves that and played in that team that night. And it was an exemplary report. Uh, sorry, uh, it was an exemplary. Um, what's what's the word for it? Uh, It was a pretty playing position from from all of us because again we uh, that level it was a European semi final so it was different from the league that we've been playing because we've been playing in the reserves but I knew that we were with the best players I knew that we had the players around us again who weren't going to lie down 
I knew that we found a way. That's what we always did. And to back it up with that, we had 10,000 people on the, on the, on the terraces who traveled from Liverpool. We carried huge support wherever we went. Um, to see their faces and the joy after the game, because again, nobody gives us a chance. Nobody. And that's how we like it. We love being the underdogs here. Well, we, we can't be we can't be the dogs no more because again we're Liverpool and our history tells that. But it's um it was a it was a fantastic night and and again the, the focus and the adulation again when we got home the next day when we flew back to Liverpool again, it was like as if we'd won the, the um the European Cup because the fans again were waiting at the airport for us to congratulate us and um it was a it was a it was a great feeling to think that I contributed to to this part of Liverpool's history. And, and you definitely did. But talk about your um, conversation or interaction with your dad after that. Did you get a chance to talk to your father after or No, well, come, well come, when, when I came home again, as I say, we didn't have mobile phones then. Um, everything was on a fixed landline. And uh, I, I went and spoke to my dad, obviously, again the, the next day. And, Again, me, me dad worked in Fords, so I could imagine that he couldn't wait to get into Fords the next day because most of his, me, me dad was ever Tony. So when he's gone into work the next day and all his mates and that again were patting him on the back, he was, he, he was, it was like Christmas for him. I mean, I could imagine again the adulation that he must have felt through me. You know what I mean? So, um, he must have been a, a, a very, very proud man to see the, that his son has, has achieved um, on a, a world stage what I, what I, from where I'd come from. Again, as I say, I hadn't been through the academies or what they used to call sensitive excellences. I didn't come into football until I was 19. So I had to learn quick. But I had the ability again that, uh, that seen me through. And and before we end this great conversation, talk about that proud moment you and your father had when y'all both went to Africa. I think it was for Fever uh, when it was in South Africa. No, no, or... we got that. No, no, no. My dad died in nineteen ninety four, um, just after but... I retired. Played, um, he he just come. He came back from Sierra Leone with malaria. Oh wow! And um, within, I think it was what forty-eight hours, we had him in the hospital. Um, oh wow! They under contentious conditions, he died. They gave him morphine. Wow! And when they were giving me that morphine, me, 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 out the book were watching him. The doctor administered the morphine, and. They couldn't find a, a vein. The doctor's hand was shaking like that with the needle. And I'm nudging my brother. Huh. Are you watching this? Are you watching this? But when they give you morphine, they give you the thing called adrenaline, which reverses it. Morphine zonks you. The adrenaline brings you back. Right. Well, they give me that two of those adrenaline and didn't bring them back. Wow. We 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 took the we took them to court, but again, as I say, you 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 it's very very hard to get a result out of the the pharmaceutical or the the medical profession. It's very very hard. But as I say, I I, I put that even to this day, I would say that they they killed me. That killed them, and again, there was no there was no come up for. Them. But um, no, we didn't, didn't. I didn't. I said, that was a, it. Was a regret that I had, is that I didn't go to Africa with me dad. Right, that was a regret. Yeah. And I ended up going after he died. Um, I think of, yeah, six months after he died, I went to where I said one and again told his family and the people there again as to see what had happened and as I say that was a, a a legacy. But that was the the thing that I always never forgive myself for it. I had the chance to go with my dad on two occasions and it was always, again, I could only go to or do what I was going to do 
at the end of the season because I was I was working for nine months of the season. So I had a three month window of where I could go. And my dad always wanted me to go with him at the end of the season. I always wanted to relax and right. and try and get out to get myself ready for the next season. I didn't fancy going to and I regret it now. I do, I certainly regret it. I should have gone with him. But at the end of the day, the, the, his legacy and your legacy are together, it, it, together at the end of the day. For what he did, what he sacrificed, um, you know, to put you in the position that you're in, to 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 be this legendary icon of change that needs change that still need to happen, but to to, no, but to be I, that I don't change. see me, I don't see myself you don't as see? legendary, and I don't see myself do. as, as as an icon. As I say, I see myself as somebody who tries to do the right thing for the for the right the right people. And speak out again against the injustice, and I think that we should all, could we should all be legends, we should all be icons, and if we were, we wouldn't be in this position that we're in today, because we don't, because we we accept the wrong narrative, and yet we push back our own culture, and our own history, and we deny ourselves. So I think that that's where it lies. I don't think that people like me again. I'm fortunate that I was uh, I was in a place, or I was put in a place that gave me the platform, the elevation to talk about these things. And now I see back to the time with the riots where they told me that you all be better off keeping out of this and saving your powder because again you'd be more beneficial in the future with the position that you have or you have attained is that you now have a voice where people will listen to you. So I think all of us, again, as I say, I don't. I think giving people labels of legend and um, and stalwarts and, and things like that, I think again, as I say, it could it can be in many ways a, a, a compliment, and it can be in many ways again a, 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 a fillip. But I look back on what I've done, what I've said, and what I've achieved, and. I kind of like question myself because I, I don't think that I've done enough. Uh -huh. And can I'm always asking myself, can I do more? Like I know that there, 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 there may be black footballers from my area who wouldn't come on a, a media portal and talk about this, skate around it, in case the neighbours who live, they live next door to get to listen to or hear this. And knock on the door and say, What are you talking about these bloody black issues? And why da, 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 da. that's what they're afraid of. Because again, most of them, again, we have this, this, um, we have this bringing as, as black people that we've got to break out of the ghetto. The ghetto's a bad place, and we've got to make it out of there. Got two white babies either side of you, you've made it out. And instead of staying in our community, building our communities, those icons again. And that's where the difference came with me is that when I first went to Liverpool, they told me I had to move out of the black community. Right. So I did. But every day after work, I came in there because that's where all my mates were. So I went and laid my head out in the white district. But every day again, as I said, I was with my friends and my family. But they, 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 that's what they'd ask me to do. Now again, people see that as a pathway. Okay. I've got to get out to the black community. I've got to be a middle class white person. I live with the middle class. I've got to have this distinction that I'm different or I'm better than my family, my culture, my people. And it shouldn't be that way. But that's the consciousness that we have in ourselves. We don't do for ourselves. We kill ourselves. We kill our neighbours. We call each other niggers now. We don't let white people do it no more. We do it for ourselves. And it's a culture again of what, again of, of how we've been coerced down that road. White people are saying, you know what? We don't have to call them niggers no more. They call it themselves. They call them the witches. 
they call it this, this, this again. We just step back now and listen to listen to the song, uh, how sweet the song it is. Isn't it? Isn't it so beautiful when it doesn't come out of our mouths? Eh? When it comes out of our mouths, they shout, this is da, 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 da. now it's coming out of their mouths. Eh? We just nod. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right there. He, he's a nigger. Eh? He likes. And that's the consciousness again that that we have, and we don't see it. You know what I mean? And and and, and that's where again we're we're uneducated as a culture, as black people, to allow us again to 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 to, to indignate ourselves, we beat ourselves up, we call ourselves, they don't have to do it no more. We rob ourselves, we kill ourselves, we hate ourselves. Yeah. That's where we are now as a as a as a culture right across this planet. And it's yeah. been designed. It's been designed. Mm -hmm. It's they've set this man to that again. Where it is, divide and rule, divide and rule. And this is what they've done for years. Is uh, I seen a, an article yesterday that uh, there are twenty two countries on this planet that the that the white people haven't colonized or put in war. Everywhere they've gone, they've set war in place or set man neighbor against neighbor. That's how they do. And right now, again, we're doing it again with Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. And white people are saying, nah, nah, no, 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 no. Why should we be thinking about Black Lives What about us? Hey, what about us? What doesn't, doesn't our lives matter? There's the divide and the rule. Because at the end of the day, it should be all lives matter. Not black, not white, not Asian. All lives should matter. But they put this quango in that is it did that to divide and rule, to split everybody, taking the knee. You know what I mean? Colin Cabinet took the knee. But look what he did for them. Nobody again, none of the, the black players didn't say, well, listen, we're not playing no more until you bring him back into the game. No, they didn't because they're all against living with the wage packet, the million dollar dollars out in Beverly Hills or whatever. They're living with them and they don't want to sacrifice that. They don't want to give you know what I mean? they don't want to give that up. And that's where the as I say, I think the, the coon mentality comes in. Is that culture or the the, the 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 privilege that they have far outweighs the culture and the history that we have. So they'd rather sell themselves or be themselves a, a million dollars living in a top house with a top car and top dirty. But you can bet your life that all or nearly all their friends are white. They're not black no more because we've left that for seen, for giving it up. And that's a culture again, as I say, that we've uh, that we've. We've sown, to it. we've knitted this, we've let it happen ourselves. And then, and then, and that's why it was important to have you on because I think my generation needs to hear from the elders. I think it's important because to hear your story and what you went through and your friends and family went through, that we need to listen, understand it, and apply it to our life to help the next generation. And that's paving it for the forward. And that's why I wanted you on the show and have this in-depth conversation. Uh, again, thank you for this book. This is an amazing book. This is an amazing read. It's one of, hands out, my favorite I, book. I, I know I know people, again, again black people, is it a, they wouldn't do this. And right. because you're black, I did a point again that I am gonna do this. Because as I say, we don't help each other. If you went to a certain Pete and you went, listen, I want to do that. Nah, 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 nah. If the white people went, yo, oh, no, yeah, 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 what time? Yeah, do I want up there? Do you want me to wear the tie? <laughs> and that's again, that's, that's, how we, that's how we think. And I'm thinking, again, as soon as I see this, if, yeah, I, don't, I, mean, I don't really want to do that. But I looked at you being black. So if I can help you through your media, well, that you raise your profile, then I've done something positive. I'm helping somebody else up the ladder. And, and I thank you for that. And I just feel like it's important, especially here in the States, that people need to hear your story. Yeah, thank and, you. And, and, I, 
and I think it's it's important. You know, you know, you're a part of this history of activism. And often what happens is we kind of separate ourselves from the US and the UK by our stories connect to, to connect yes. each other. And so if, through my platform, if I can break that wall where people listen to this interview and then learn more about your story, then I did my job too. Yeah. Yeah, if there's any advice that I would give to people, um, is is remember where you, where your soul is and where your soul comes from. If you want to make it in life, um, and maybe again, as I say, we've got money, but we go to Africa and spend your money. I mean, invest there, build houses there, build holiday homes there. Let's go and have our holidays there, because again, once we start doing that, the white people start going there as well. But there's places again in Africa again that they're idyllic, they're beautiful. It's not just about bloody palms and bloody prairies and watching bloody uh, cheetah chasing the bloody warthog across the bloody the prairie. You know what I mean? There's places in Africa that are more benevolent and better. Beverly Hills, when you see them houses there, but nobody shows you that. Yeah. They, we had the media port ourselves, go there and start doing programs and show people what, what Africa is. I mean, I think, again, we had, a, we had, we had a, 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 a channel in America years ago, BET, they bought that. They were not having that. Hey, what, they're going to be showing all their own cultural programs? No, 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 no. <laughs> we need to acquire that, what's the name, and make sure that we, 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 we control what they put out, what they see. And yeah. what they know. So That's right. again, as I say, I'd advise anybody again: if if you haven't been, go to Africa, find out about your your heritage. It's not the place that it's been painted. It's beautiful. The people there are, are lovely, and will do anything for you. And you get more uh, for yeah. your money there as well. Facts. But, uh, but listen, thanks for for having me on. It's a it's a pleasure to share this. No, I thank you for your time, and I appreciate you. And anytime you want to come back on, you're always welcome to come on. You're like, you're like, if it's okay, if I can call you uncle, because you're like my uncle from the UK. No, like, it's so not never... that old. Because <laughs> <laughs> anytime I reach you, you're always welcome to listen to what I have to say. And I reach out to you. And I'm like, hey do you want to do this interview? And you're like, sure. So that's what uncles do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stop it, man. Thank you, sir. Well, anyway, listen, th thanks for having me on the bro. And good luck for the future, really. All right. Thank you. Take care.